Today, I will be talking about discrete event simulation. How many of you have heard of discrete event simulation? Great, amazing, perfect. Um, so unwritten subtitle is better than XGBoost. <laughs> unwritten sub subtitle, it depends, of course. Uh, so basically, this presentation will be a, a bit of um, evangelization of white, white box models. Why? So we will cover the basic journalist questions, what, why, how, who did it, does it fly, and so forth. Um, I will skip the shameless promotion of our company um, because then it will kick me out. <laughs> uh, but so we all know this, uh, this quote. You heard it a thousand, thousand times. It's already boring and annoying, but uh, every, truth, every truth hurts. Huh? And this is one of the, one of the big truths. And um, the thing is that in, uh, in every profession, in every domain, uh, we get overfitted. To, the, to our toolbox. And we will rather keep using our tools in a wrong way than learn how to use a new tool. So, for example, all the models we have talked about today and the models that you will see online in 99% of, of the tutorials are from uh, linear models over random forest, gradient boosting, to, uh, to deep learning models and so forth. But what's, what's one common thing for all these models? Uh, when you dig under, so they're, they're black box models, which does not mean what people say, that we don't know what's in the model, because we can put logs and we know what's in the model, we know our decision trees. We don't know what's in the process. So that's the issue, actually. So our models are in not in any way actually learning uh, what's happening in there. They're just learning to, to map a vector to a vector or a vector to a point. It, they're just like flying over this, this whole process which is happening in between, which Again, works fantastically in many applications, don't get me wrong, so we don't want to over-engineer anything. When it works, it works. But many times uh, we are interested, we have, as we said, like a time series or any time-dependent process. We have certain states, we have entity interplay, we have interplay of entities and resources, and all this can become very complex. So for example, what do we do when we have time in our process? Uh, we apply this clever hack, uh, we put, previous values of our process as features in our feature vector. Uh, then we get some kind of surrogate of, uh, of an ARIMA model. And again, as we say, it can work. It does work for a certain limited uh, set of uh, processes. But it's a stretch. It's a hack. And uh, in the end, it's how you say, it's hammering a square, square peg in a round hole. More, moreover, we have problems with how do we encode prior expert knowledge? Uh, in our in our model. So why are we asking the model to learn something that we already know? So then you, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of data. How do we mod model in interplay of entities and resources? I mean, I'm curious to know how would you do it with a random forest? Maybe you would find an ingenious way, but it's, it's a waste of your time in the end. And finally, uh, this what we learn, this mapping which we learn, is really tied to this specific uh, instance of the process. So if you think of a bank, where people are entering and uh, so you, you have some kind of queues and you have counters. Um, with a, with a, this standard mapping approach, you cannot model an alternative scenario. What if I add five counters here? You'd have to put five counters, collect the data, and then try to make some kind of a prediction. It's very hard uh, to, to model alternative scenarios which, which where the alternative is not a different input. So we are doing training testing on different inputs but not on alternative process structures most of the time. So what if we lived in, in a Disneyland and we had a, something nice, a tool, a library, and an approach to make this all, again, not simple, but a bit less painful. And this one of the approaches, it's not the one size fits all, but one of the approaches for this is discrete event simulation, which is basically an approach of modeling your process as a series of discrete events. When we say discrete, we don't mean discrete like your um, uh, incognito mode in your uh, browser, uh, but discrete is mathematical terms that's happening in an infinitely short amount of time. And it's again an approximation, uh, but a very useful one. So we can see here an approximation of a child uh, eating, playing, crying. Then you grow up, then there's no more playing, just eating and crying. And, uh, but essentially, if you heard of Markov state models, uh, this is this is the same thing. This is Markov, Markov models are a theoretical explanation, theoretical, uh, yeah, theoretical model of the discrete event simulation. Uh, you have your states, so a child is the entity going through these states. You have probabilities of transitions, 
and you have, uh, you have probabilities of staying in the same state. So white box model, white box part here is that you are the one that needs to, needs to specify this, discover and specify, and you can add machine learning there to learn these probabilities of transitions. So in other words, we are, we're doing a bit of more effort to replicate this real life process in a virtual environment where we can <coughs> experiment with different inputs, again, like traditional models we're using, uh, to better understand the behavior. So once you, have this, once you have this model and you say, oh, my child is not doing homework, why? Then you can analyze uh, this process and say, oh, he's spending too much time, I don't know, eating or something like that. So you can really pinpoint the bottlenecks uh, uh, behind it. Yeah, I can understand him. Uh, and basically, what the thing I stressed a bit earlier is like, you can, you can try different scenarios. So you can say, maybe you want to break down this whole trajectory of playing into playing with toys, playing outside, playing with friends. And then you want to say, uh, what if my child is playing with one friend or with two friends? So then, there are, then you, these trajectories can, can play with each other. As you can understand, it's not simple to do. So, uh, but you can understand also that this type of process is very uh, convenient for modeling for example, uh, manufacturing, manufacturing processes, where you can save a lot of time. There are many people who got rich by improving a certain manufacturing processes in the automotive industry by, I don't know, shuffling just by they, in their, their smartness. They <laughs> managed to find better processes. Well, DC, uh, DES can help you also do that. Also, uh, logistics, tra sorry, transport. Uh, and healthcare, for example, prioritization, triage, when you, when you have, uh, how many nurses should you have? How many uh, reception desk uh, staff should you have to minimize queues on a tight budget, as it's always the case. So I hope I sold this to you a bit. Uh, and now we will see uh, how you can do it actually in practice. So uh, the first thing to do is actually to discover your process. And often, uh, as with everything, there is a big uh, discrepancy between your first ideas and the reality. So there are two ways to do it. Basically, you can do the manual footwork approach, which is, for example, what we did in our case. We sat down with, uh, with the stakeholders, with the client, and we said, okay, how does this uh, whole process function? We mapped it out and we implemented it. Another way is to do automated approach, where you can use uh, some nice pieces of software uh, to, for the same purpose. So to do an automated <laughs> approach, of course, you need data. You need data for the manual part, but yeah. Uh, and the general format, it's not really complex uh, as long as you are collecting that data. And in today's world, at least we have an abundance of that. But you basically need data on what is happening when or who is doing what when, using what resources. It's basically a table. You will see an example. So this is an example I found online about uh, applying uh, discrete event simulation on some kind of phone repair shop. So you see phone number 3651 was received at this time by this guy in this location. And you don't have to sort it. You just, I mean, you just need to give these events to, to your uh, nice tool. You run through it and then you get something like this. You get a diagram which shows you where the thickness indicates the frequency or the probability of a transition from one state to the other. You see which states are connected. And this is the start, let's say, of your journey. You still did not do your simulation, all your experiments, but now you at least know your process. Um, there are nice tools for it. So just that, again, I'm not advertising or selling anything. We don't have any partnerships. There are closed source. There are open source tools. We have used this uh, trial version of this disco tool uh, to, to, yeah, you can use it to play around. So we, for, for the same project uh, that we did, uh, it was the trial version appeared fine for our application. So I would encourage you to uh, to try it. And you can use also the open source. As always, no free lunch. Open source means you do more and more things on your own. Um, how you do it in R? So, in R, there's this nice package called Simmer. And it's not a complete, uh, I should say, coincidence that I'm presenting this topic here. Uh, the reason why I, I, how I learned first about uh, discrete event simulation is because our CEO uh, is the co author of, <laughs> of this package. Uh, I was also the one resisting to use it. I was like, no, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to write some. I, I first wanted to write some for loops or whatever for a specific problem. But he said, come on, no, don't waste your time. Take this. There is a package. It's apparently, so you have like SimPy for Python. You have some SimJulia thing for Julia. And you have Simmer for R. And R is the new, uh, Simmer is the newest of them all. And I think using the latest up-to-date paradigms 
uh, and it has the C++ backend, so it's quite fast. You can parallelize and it works well. So the very, very short tutorial, it's not a workshop, but let's give you a bit of uh, practical knowledge. You define uh, these graphs, which are called trajectories in Simmer. You say, okay, so this is how a person or a, or a pallet of, of beer or whatever would move through, through, through the world, through warehouses or something. Uh, you create the resources that this trajectory requires. If it's a person in a bank, you create the counters. You, you create this little sim city, huh? let's call it like that. You create this, uh, this virtual space. Uh, you, you then create for this each person, I would call it like a person printer. You create something which creates, generates these uh, little bots which move around your bank or your warehouse. And then you run your simulation. You run it n times. Uh, it also gives you, uh, because if you have some stochastic uh, components of the process, you can see, you can make a Monte Carlo analysis, see the worst case and the best case. And then finally, of course, fetch and analyze results. So uh, when we talk about code, yeah, this is, there's also, we'll give you like a minimal, minimal example. Uh, you load uh, the library, set the seed, of course, first things first, never forget it. Uh, bad things happen, universe implodes, and so forth. Uh, otherwise, um, you basically define this trajectory, as we said, as a customer. The, the cool thing here to maybe notice is that uh, it supports this uh, dplyr or magritter pipe uh, piping operator. So you can just, uh, one after each other, you can just layer your, uh, your process steps. Uh, this person arrives to the bank, he takes a counter, he bo bothers the person for 12 minutes, and then he leaves. Uh, and Finally, so this is you just created this trajectory. Then you need to create the whole bank with the trajectory in there and the generator of different these trajectories of let's say the people going in there, and you run the simulation and then you extract your data and you see, for example, oh at this counter in this is the distribution of queues. I had if I added um, two counters more, I would not have queues. And this this really helps you uh, helps you improve improve your process. Uh, the basic grammar. The basic functions you have is like C's, a bit of uh, communist terminology, yeah? C's the means of production. Uh, then you, you wait a bit in it, and then you release. That, that's not the communist manifesto, the release. Uh, uh, yes, you can set some attributes. You can get the attributes, uh, of course. And uh, these are just the, let's say, 80-20 approach. I, with this, you, you really solve most of your needs. And finally, you can leave. You can get angry, leave the bank. Uh, suddenly, uh, you can roll back if you need to repeat the part of the step, and you, th there's a way for you to branch, where you define multiple trajectories and branch on certain conditions. Cool. Now, just okay. My time is good. Uh, if I skip, if something is not clear, we'll talk in the in the Q and A. So the problem we have uh, tackled is uh, for a major brewery. Uh, we have we have been working with their logistics department, and they they have been using some kind of Excel tools. Uh, to to predict their uh, let's say their warehousing budget demands and so forth, which was uh, based on a lot of assumptions, uh, which did not which did not yeah hold in the end and uh, provide very uh, unsatisfactory performance. So we decided to apply um, a discrete event simulation to model this warehousing process, basically how how a pallet of beer is moving from the production to a one warehouse to another warehouse or to the market. There are something also called repackaging facilities and so forth. It's not a very complex process, but uh, it, was a, it was a very good use case for, uh, it would be held to do it using other approaches, let's say. So this is the, uh, this is the process diagram. Basically, you see the f you have many factories. So each, each type of beer has different graph of movement. Think of it like that. And so you need to produce, you say, oh, my schedule is to produce uh, 100 uh, hectoliters of uh, Superbock and then, uh, 100 hectoliters of uh, Stella, and then this thing needs to, you need to observe how, let's these little ants, these pallet ants are moving through your, through your warehouses. So you have basically, you come from the production warehouse to the, to the, the internal warehouse, to the uh, external warehouse or to the market, not such a complex graph, but when, so there are many internal warehouses, many external warehouses for one dummy SKU, so this is not an actual number, uh, you can see that the number of, of uh, the, the percentage of times it moves directly to the market from the production or if it goes to a different warehouse. And for example, one of the interesting things here, you can see uh, on, the, on the right side, this, this return loop. Uh, so it shows that in one warehouse, there was a lot of internal movement 
like 5% of time, something would move internally. So for our client, just this discovery was quite interesting and raised some further investigations, let's say. So why do we are, why are we moving things within the warehouse? So just the process discovery part, uh, even before you do the simulations, can be, can be very interesting. And so then you basically parameterize, you, you take these distributions and you put them in your uh, discrete event simulation model. And so I cannot show you some very nice fancy graphs uh, still because it's a bit, it's, it's not a bit, but it's confidential. Uh, but in, in rough words, we achieved a satisfactory performance in this case compared to, compared to the baseline of the Excel model. Uh, so m the most important things are these storage days. So how much on average beers, how much time it spends uh, in, uh, in different warehouses where we had the 4% mean absolute error. Okay, sorry, I think I heard something. Um, so the conclusion is that, there will be another conclusion, conclusion of this project uh, is that uh, discrete event simulation Ignore my, my typo, DC, I don't know why, it's DES. Um, we, it allowed us to model the process in a natural form. So you're basically translating your, your real natural knowledge to, to, the, to the algorithm, uh, leveraging clients' business knowledge. That was, that was very important. Uh, also running a number of simulations with these uh, variable parameters, variable distributions, allowed us to show the client the worst and the best case scenario. Uh, and I'm improvement points, okay, this was a proof of concept, so we did not, it was very time limited uh, how much effort we can put in it, but let's say we didn't even apply uh, seasonal changes in distributions. As you know, beer is very seasonal, <laughs> so it's not the same demand and the same distribution of movement in summer and in the, in the winter. But basically, yeah, this is, this is something for us going forward. Um, and so just a, just a brief recap. Uh, Discrete event simulation is a white, you can say grayish process model because you can, you can have parts which you don't, let's say, break down and model, where you can leave a dose of uncertainty. And you can use, let's say, we did not do it, but you can combine white modeling and, and uh, black box modeling. Uh, it does require process understanding, so which means it requires a bit more effort. So, but I would say it pays off. Don't be lazy. Do it. I just say, be a good boy. <laughs> Uh, it's like, so time consuming, but the, the output which you get in the end is very granular. And last point, it's really not uh, the alternative to all the models we talked about. It's one of the alternatives, but I think we should all every day try to see what's, what's on the market, what, what exists there, because it can save us time from reinventing the wheel and hammering the, the spare peg in the, in the round hole. Uh, there are some also, yeah, as you said, in other words, can be time consuming. Uh, and it has like a fixed number of states, so you define the fixed graph. So it's probably not really good for some high degree of freedom simulations when you want something like for reinforcement learning, where you need this agent to have really un unpredicted freedom, let's say, to do anything. But because in this uh, approach, you really specify what it can do explicitly. Uh, so that would be it. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Thank you.